They say that it's polite to show up just a little late to every party. Well, I decided to wait 13 years to show up to the Halo LAN party, so I think my one chance at elementary fame has been squandered over the course of more than a decade. But after recently beating all of the Halo games for the first time, I can't help but want more. Side note, my disc died halfway through ODST, so I didn't really finish that, and I don't have Halo 5, because it hasn't come to Steam yet, and I don't have an Xbox One. Also, I skipped uh, Halo Wars, because my brain is smooth, and I start to short circuit when I see RTS games. There is just something so captivating about this franchise. Settings filled with intrigue, beauty, and detail. Revolutionary combat can controls with a core gameplay loop that is perfectly tailored for the best possible player experience, and a story that balances a hands-off approach that we see in games like Half-Life, as well as amazing top-of-the-line cinematics. Halo has just crafted itself into one of the fundamental building blocks of this medium, and it's earned its place at the top of gaming's hierarchy. But there are a fixed number of Halo games, and like I said, I eagerly await the two that I haven't played, and not to mention the fact that there's a new game coming around the corner, but at some point the adventures of the Jolly Green Giant and his sidekick Rule 34 bait will cease being new. Luckily for me, there are games that supposedly are better than Halo, commonly referred to as Halo Killers, but for the life of me, I can't figure out why anyone would try and kill Halo outside of profit means, which is is 90% of the game industry at this point. But let's first define what it means to be a Halo game. I know that at this point it's almost unnecessary to do so because most people have a notion of what it takes to be a Halo game if you've ever played it. However, this is one of those show your work in math class type situations where it'll help us examine these Halo killers TM. First thing it's gotta have is a beefy boy in a green suit. No, that's that's not the right that's not the right one. A beefy boy in a green suit with a gun. No, what? No, it's it's Halo. It has to have Master Chief. He's like He's like Mr. Halo. But John 117 isn't always the star of these games if we've learned anything from ODST, Reach, both Wars games, portions of 2-5, and the books. If I may be so bold to posit the notion that we as players are not there for really any specific character, we're here for the war. While Halo has always felt like a game sold on the back of its protagonist, in reality, the fact is that the characters are just blank slates for the player to imprint upon. Not just that the characters are mostly silent, but because we're told that we're a super soldier and the gameplay makes us feel like a super soldier. I feel like I'm the last line of defense against the Covenant, the Flood, these guys, and really anything with a kickable ass. So a good Halo killer needs a character that the audience can properly imprint upon. What else do games with this moniker need in order to tear down the Halo establishments? Well, I think community. Oh, there goes Dakota again, crying about how much he loves tight-knit gaming communities. Go cry about Payday with your friends some more. How'd you get in the studio? Who are you? Who hurts you? Can someone call security and get this guy out of here? He's kind of, he's kind of being a dick. The community for Halo started in a very different time, yet has grown to new heights. It's one of the most creative fan bases. Hell, a company like Rooster Teeth would never be what it is today without the tools given to them by Microsoft to create within their game and a community so large and so eager for content like that. It created and subsequently sustained its robust multiplayer fan interaction. Again, the title lives up to the hype being one of the first games to push Xbox Live, one of the first multiplayer to use voice chat in a unique way in games like Halo 2 and 3. One of the first to allow players to make their own games on a console. At least for Halo 1 through 3, the community is the tightest out there. I know that 4 later drew a divide among fans, but there is some killer multiplayer aspects to keep Halo alive and kicking. Unfortunately though, the Xbox 360 was the era of tacked on multiplayer, so a lot of the games in this video don't really make a full hearted attempt at a robust multiplayer system like Halo has. Not to let too much out of the bag, but let's just quickly compare the multiplayer in Killzone to Halo. The only Killzone to currently have an active server is the newest one. Meanwhile, Halo 3, Reach, ODST, etc. all have an active player base on 360. While I've discussed Killzone with a lot of people and they speak of it fondly, I've never really heard them mention the multiplayer, at least with the same fervor as people talk about Halos. Finally, we have the essential dagger that every Halo assassin needs in order to befall Microsoft's sole protector. Game feel. So like, 
Game feel is one of the most mysterious aspects of game design because it's only known when it's felt. This is often overlooked because it takes an enormous amount of time tinkering with small details to get it right. There's an absolute treasure trove of content following Bungie devs talking about everything from calculating the speed of alien weapons so that they feel different from the human weapons to the ingenious lock-on system to the 30 second loop that the series is known for. Every avenue of Halo's mechanics were not only scrutinized with the highest degree Degree of detail, but they were also shaped with consideration to all other systems. The AI of different opponents react uniquely based on the choices of the player and their species type. The map layout accommodates for your mobility and the 30 second core loop. And all these systems dynamically change based on the choice and difficulty. So a player's experience will be fundamentally different every time they decide to raise the bar of challenge. I could go on for hours as to why Halo is a marvel of modern game design, but that's not what I'm here to do, and there are a ton of other great videos that dive far deeper. But let's say for now that intricate design that leads to beautiful simplistic gameplay is the weapon of choice for any game looking to dethrone the chief. Rather than looking at the obvious choices first, let's discuss instead what I'll call proto-Halo killers. Yes, during the pubescent days of Microsoft's first console, many titles were attempting to be the champion of the Xbox. Back in these days, Halo wasn't much more than Microsoft blowing raspberries at Apple from across the room, as Halo was originally supposed to be a Mac exclusive. Hype may have been built up for the game before Microsoft snatched it, but the team faced many, many big changes to the game beforehand. So at this point, Billy Gates was more or less taking a gamble on Halo. But the game being good or not wasn't relevant to the wealthiest man on earth at the time. He was just excited that he got away with stealing the cool action figure from Steve Jobs. Following Halo 1 came Tao Fang, Fist of the Lotus. A game made by Mortal Kombat designers after they decided to leave Midway. With that kind of star power and hype, you'd think that Tao Fang would match up pretty easily to Halo. It's a 3D fighter that carries over the clunky stylings of Mortal Kombat and isn't nearly as fun or fluid as Virtual Fighter or Tekken. They really pushed the deep lore and story portion of the game though, as there's a lot to uncover. But unfortunately, it didn't even come close to Halo. Then you have Brutal Force, a semi-tactic sci-fi military third-person shooter. It's a neat game and was pretty good at the time, but doesn't come close to checking off any of the requirements to even attempt to kill John 117. On the opposite end of the console war, we have Sony gearing up its own FPS darling, Killzone. This is one of those games you kind of just had to be there in the time for, because it doesn't hold up nowadays. A sci-fi FPS with multiple characters to choose from and a story that's clearly trying to set up deeper lore. That sounds pretty close to an attempt at murder, but alas, this game feels more akin to the World War II Call of Duty games, with its linearity and obvious imagery that's a stand-in for a particular mustachioed man. It's clear that Guerrilla Games wasn't trying too hard to compete with Halo. After all, the PS2 did outsell the Xbox almost five to one. All they had to do was sell to their massive install base and it'd be money in the bag. Not as much, but I'm sure they saved plenty of cash by not putting in the effort to make the game feel good. That's right, I've got beef with Killzone. It's boring and I hate it. And the fact that I've played three of them and I'm constantly telling myself not to buy the fourth installment, but it's eating at me. I just, I don't know why I wanna play it. So seven days after Killzone was released, Halo 2 comes out. And that game slaps harder than ever before. I mean, it slaps harder than Mr. Blue Skies by ELO. It slaps harder than the Empire Today song. And it slaps harder than your mama after you did your first cuss. I mean, this game somehow is better than the first in almost every imaginable way, and even some unimaginable ways. So now the masses understand that Halo is the most rootinous, tootinous space opera this side of Gary Oldman's head. And the competition now knows that if they want to overtake Halo, they have to have a multi-part series with lore deeper than Mariana's Trench. That's right, cue up the WWE entrance of Advent Rising. This game came in with enough bombast to last a lifetime. Game trailers shown in theaters, an award-winning orchestral soundtrack, a $1 million in-game Easter egg hunt, and it's even written by sci-fi's favorite homophobe Orson Scott Card of Ender's Game fame. I didn't 
think hype could be purchased in such quantities. This sci-fi third-person shooter laid the seeds for an epic that already had two more scheduled games, a comic book series, and so much more in the wings. Uh, but this game didn't even come close to putting a dent in Chief's armor. Many things plagued Advent Rising. It was published by an already failing Majesco who was writing on this game, putting up the same numbers as Halo. It also came out five months before the Xbox 360 was released. And the $1 million Easter egg hunt was canceled due to, uh, let me just read this verbatim. <laughs> technical feasible solution that would allow the contest to continue in a fair and secure manner. Which is weird, considering that the promotion was literally printed on the box of every single copy. You'd think that you would have your shit together at that point. Sidebar, this contest and all the other weird stuff going on with Advent Rising is super interesting to me, and I could make a full video on it. So if you want to see something like that, let me know in the comments. I'm sure I'll make it at some point anyway. Back to the issue, the game really hurts me because it was clearly rushed. The front half of the game is filled with really innovative, fun combat, but towards the end it gets buggy and downright unfair. If this game was given just a little bit more polish, and if it was switched over to being a launch title for the three 360, it could have easily been a budding franchise that's still around to this day, but as it stands, Cortana just isn't detecting any signs of life around it. The year is now 2005 and the Xbox 360 has just finished its training montage and is ready to kick the industry's collective ass. Gears of War comes out a year later and it does all the things that Microsoft could ever want it to do. Sell games, look pretty, sell more games, showcase the system's capabilities, and sell more games. Now that's all I'm going to say about Gears of War though. In theory, it competes with Halo, but that's really just in a sales perspective. The characters are terribly uninteresting and the gameplay may have been revolutionary for the time, but just doesn't feel good now. Maybe that's my personal take on the franchise, but Gears is more of a sidekick to Halo than actually trying to kill it. Something more akin to Mario and Zelda being the flagships for Nintendo. Also, Resistance Fall of Man came out as a launch title for the PS3, and that game constantly gets thrown around into the Halo Killers mantra, but that series is more of what if World War II, but with aliens. 1 and 3 are also great games, but they don't really seem to be all that worried about giving the Master Chief a good what for. Then, in 2007, a game called Halo 3 came out to no applause, no one really gave a shit about this game. Just kidding, the world lost their collective damn minds over this game. I'm not gonna lie, in 2007, I was 12 years old and I just didn't give two shits about any game that wasn't Fire Emblem for the Game Boy Advance. I didn't really play many games at that point in time, and when I started actually getting into the scene, still didn't understand why people loved Halo so much, or why they considered the third game to be the best in the series. It's honestly a little rare for the third one of anything to be good. But I played it for the first time last year, and I, I get it. I just, I get it now guys. I understand why the Xbox 360 was so far out in front of the console wars at this point. I understand why people say that the story of Halo is amazing, and I understand why marketing and development boomers in charge of finance wanted to usurp Halo. This title was the perfect amalgamation of everything that the series did right, and it still found ways to innovate, all while selling 14.5 million copies. That's not even including the people who just bought a 360 for this game, or the amount of new subscribers on Xbox Live. This franchise generated money, and it proved that MasterChef was the certifiable Food Network five-star recipe for success. And when you have a proven track record of success and large profits, industry heads will do anything in their power to ride that bandwagon for smaller profits or just to try and outright hijack the whole damn thing. This is where the term Halo Killer really kicks off, seeing many other iterations of Space Marine-focused FPSs which most of these games fail to come close to even understanding what made Halo 3 sell in the first place. Now that's not to say that there weren't actually good games to follow in the footsteps of Halo 3 with similar concepts. Crisis 1 launched a few months later and it saw marines taking on otherworldly beings. This game saw good sales figures, favorable critic reception, and it even received the coveted overused reductive phrase, can it run Crisis? Honestly, I would say the Crisis series is the closest 
thing to a true Halo killer that we would get. But the franchise doesn't really take off in the same exponential way. Call of Duty Modern Warfare also came out a month after Halo 3, a game that would spawn the most profitable milking scheme known to man, putting out a game virtually every year, raking in more money than any other franchise at the time, and effectively putting to rest the term Halo killer in favor of everyone focusing on the next game to top Call of Duty. Sure, in a sales sense, I guess you could say COD overtook Halo, but I would argue that Halo holds up several years down the line, whereas COD just won't. Gun to my head, I might be able to name two characters from the COD franchise, and if you followed up that question with another one asking about the plot, my brains would be on the floor. While COD is a tight shooter, the story just isn't there. So in theory, this would be the best use case of the phrase, but in reality, it's just apples to oranges. But now for the main event. The game that really pushed this phrase into full gear. Free Radical Swan Song Haze. I really want to start this though by putting a positive note because the game could have genuinely been good. Number two, rub Derek Sizzlewood down in hot baby oil and wrestle him like an ancient Greek. Yummy. Number three, convince everyone that Haze is awesome. Okay, well let's start with number three first and number two later. But oppressive publisher input and poor marketing killed this game before it even shipped. The general premise was good enough for me to pick up the game despite having read a ton of criticism that should have steered me away. You play as a soldier for a massive corporation here to harvest the natural resources and eradicate a terrorist group that inhabits the planet. You and the entire military are aided by the drug Nectar, a performance enhancer built into your suit. Nectar allows you to heal faster, take more damage, become more accurate, and gain better visibility over the battlefield however too much and it'll throw you into a fit of rage that depletes your health. After about an hour into the game with this superpower, you find out the evilness of the corporation, you defect sides, and leave Nectar behind. This is where the potential for the game could really shine, but instead goes to waste. If the enemy is outfitted with superior technology, super suits, and an unstoppable drug, it should take far more effort to defeat these enemies as just a normal person. The game, in theory, should have gone from an FPS to more of a stealthy takedown type deal. But the game doesn't take that route and instead, the only difference between you and the military units that you used to be with is a big insta-kill target on their back. This is a huge missed opportunity and one that would have made the whole experience a lot more interesting. Another missed opportunity was that the marketing gave away the plot twist. Not like this twist couldn't have been seen from a mile away due to or writing, but it still would have been far cooler to go in this game with no preconceived notions. I think that the marketing team either didn't have much to go on or just flat out didn't care about ruining the biggest part of the story. An important distinction to make is that no one at Free Radical other than the folks in charge of marketing and sales wanted Hayes to even remotely be compared to Halo. The third installment had just been released and received critical acclaim, and the developers knew that due to being rushed by Ubisoft, their game wasn't going to be half as good as Halo 3. But never Nevertheless, the marketing team used the term Halo Killer to hell and back and garnered some real hype this way. But when one hoists their own golden foot to eye level for everyone to see, more often than not, they end up sticking it right in their own mouth. Hayes was relentlessly mocked for not even coming close to killing Halo. The only real similarities to the games were that they were FPS with big burly men as the protagonist, it kind of had multiplayer, and they're both four letter words starting with H. In my humble opinion, this game did not deserve to be tossed aside because it was labeled a Halo killer. I honestly think that with a little bit more time in the oven and a complete 180 from the marketing department, this could have been a decent early title for the PlayStation. It might have even gotten a sequel or at least gotten Free Radical some breathing room to release Star Wars Battlefront 3 before getting the boot. It's funny to think that this game effectively killed our chances of getting Battlefront 3. Now I, now I feel suddenly a lot less worse for painting this game in such a negative light. No, 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 it's fine that upper management fucked everything up. No worries. The corn promotional song for this game will patch everything up. For a term that became such a buzzword among gamers, writers, and marketing folks, it never really held any meaning. There weren't any games that would have made a player abandon Halo permanently. In the same vein as there's no mascot that rose up to take on the cultural significance as Master Chief. I know that it's popular to claim that 343 Industries killed Halo, but those games that they produced are still by all accounts 
quality games. They're just not up to par with the scrutiny that Bungie put them under. At its core, the phrase Halo Killer means nothing. It's something that people said to describe a shooter with a passing whiff of sci-fi flair. All it really serves to do is belittle games that deserve to be looked at in their own merit, which is odd considering that labeling a game a Halo Killer at one point was high praise. I played through a lot of games for this episode, and I found some amazing titles that I truly enjoyed. I go so far as to say that I liked most of what I played. So while the term Halo Killer most likely will never be used outside of a historical discussion for this period in gaming, we must look at games on a personal and critical level and not get sucked in with a hot button key phrase that some overpaid marketing buffoon throws out there. Thank you so much for finishing this video. I've been working on it for over a year. If you want to see another video that I worked on for over a year, here's one where I find 100 free games on Steam and tell you which ones are the best. Thanks for stopping by and don't forget to click subscribe. See ya!